it's Phil for BlueFirePoker.com, and I'm just doing uh, the second part, going over the second part of this match I played against David Benjamin at 501k no limit. Uh, I just jumped right into the action. Uh, if you remember from the first video, I was playing this very late at night, and I was not really on top of my game. I think that I, we caught a few mistakes in my first video, and I'm hoping, or maybe not hoping, but <laughs> kind of hoping to catch a few more, and I will certainly let you know when I don't like the way I played a hand. Um, he right now is up about 65,000, um, which, you know, I don't think is too important to consider. You know, it's not, he's not, you know, overwhelmingly in the lead, you know, taking control of the match momentum-wise, so I don't think it's going to change the dynamic very much. I decided to raise here. <clears throat> I don't attack I don't attack limps as, as aggressively as most people, but it was his first limp, I believe, and pretty much everybody's first limp is weak. I guess you can level me with that now, but for the most part, people just aren't... People without, like, a precedent of limps getting raised aren't just going to limp and exp expect you to raise in limpery race. So, I think that he's very weak when he limps the first time. Uh, on the turn, I think it's a pretty easy check. You know, I could get check raise semi left off my hand occasionally, and he does have a made hand too often of the time to consider protecting my hand. And I also can pick off some bluffs on the river. The 7 improves some of his floats, and also I just think that since the board was dry and bricked off a little bit, he is going to be value bending very thinly there. I decided to raise a limp again. Oh, okay. So I was showing you that he's involved in a big hand on another table right there, which is why I raised that limp. I think that if somebody's focusing on a big hand, they're not going to think to make a non-standard play like a limp raise and if they do limp a marginal hand, they're not going to think, or they're not going to, yeah, they're not going to think to limp raise bluff, and they're not going to be as interested in contesting the pot, since they have another big pot to worry about. He leads into me when I flopped an open ender. This is actually a little bit interesting. I think that, yeah, okay, good. I think I like a raise here. Uh... Okay, he's still involved in that big pot, and it's actually gotten bigger. So I don't expect him to make a big move on me here. And at the same time, I expect him to... I expect to have great equity against his range. Not great, but good. So if he calls, uh... I usually have two overs. And obviously the open ender. And I think I also have a lot of implied odds if I hit. If he does 3-bet me, it's going to be... Pretty awkward, uh, especially just because he's involved in such a big hand on the other table that I don't think he's gonna just. I don't think he's gonna be three bet folding very much. But at the same time, it's kind of gross to uh, raise the flop with an open ender with the draw this strong to fold to a re raise. Interesting turn again. Uh, I think I can very credibly rep flush, but I would hate to get check raised off this hand. I think he has. A flush in his range a lot. But I also think uh, a lot of his leading range, uh, if you notice from last match, is strong top hair type hands. So I think he has a7 a lot, uh, maybe even a6, or, you know, whatever, any other 7, 8-7. Uh, he also is going to have a lot of hands like maybe 8 or 7x with a heart. So... I decide to bet 17,000 for a couple reasons. One, I think uh, if I bet something like 23,000, that gives him a good uh, stack size to check shove with a lot of his semi bluffs and made hands. Where this uh, makes his check shove a little bit of an over bet, so I think he'll be more likely to check call. And that gives me a chance to hit my hand. Uh, I also think that if the board bricks off, that I have a good opportunity to bluff, because I think I, I look very, very strong, and I think that he, if he does have a hand like 7-8 with 8 of hearts, he's certainly going to be calling turn and then folding the river. Uh, he also, I actually don't remember where he is right now on the other table, but I think he might still be involved with that big hand. 
Uh, or if he is involved with it, he just uh, either won a big pot or lost a big pot, both of which usually will make people less likely to uh, make a move here on the turn. For a couple reasons, I should explain that. The first reason being that if he just won a big pot, he's going to be kind of content and not in the mood to mess around so much, and if he just lost a big pot, he's going to be, depending on how he lost it, but a lot of times when people make a move and lose a big pot, they're going to be kind of sad about it and uh, embarrassed and not want to be caught making a move again. Four's not a great card. I'd prefer just like an offsuit king for a bluff, but I think that it's still a pretty good spot to bluff just given his uh, likely hands, which are, you know... Uh, weak made hands with a draw, I think, are a huge part of his range. Also, I'm very, very credibly repping a big hand here. And so I think overbet's shove. It's a very small overbet, but I think it's the right size in a spot like this. I think it looks the strongest. And I think that, given our history, I think he'd expect me to make that with a lot of my strong hands there. And I take down the pot, which is what I was trying to do. The one thing I'll say about um, momentum, which is kind of a factor of, you know, if we had been involved in a big pot, which we just were here, uh, it shifts the momentum a bit in my favor. And I think momentum's a lot uh, overvalued by a lot of the poker community, but only overvalued in that I think they think it comes from something that it doesn't. Momentum only comes from the person losing uh, having less confidence to to trust his reads and make big moves, and the person winning having more confidence to do that. You know, if you can maintain, if you can figure out how to maintain your confidence while losing, uh, you won't really lose momentum in a match, except for the fact that they're going to gain confidence when winning. So, uh, I think that that's something that, you know, momentum, losing momentum in a heads-up match is something that, it's real, it exists, but it's something that you can prevent, kind of. He check calls a flop, and given how often he's been leading his top pair type hands, uh, I think I'm good most of the time here. 5-4 uh, got there, which he would check call with, but I think that um, I, ex I think that a bet there would have been a good play. Um, one problem with a bet is that I don't I don't know if I want to three barrel for value just because he does have a jack very often when he calls three streets there I think it's okay too especially because of all the one card gutters on the board or not all of them but uh, there's any five any four is a gutter and then there's all the uh, I guess any yeah and then 10-8 uh, 10-9 ten, ten, uh, uh, so I think that he would talk himself into a call with a seven but he also he has a jack almost as often as a seven. Not quite as often, I think, though, especially because he leads his top pairs, or he has so far in the match. So I actually think three barreling for value here would have been good. And, you know, the other benefit is that I could take him off some hands with some outs, like, I don't know, ace five that he might have floated and decides to fold the turn, or ace ten. Oh, he bets the river, and this is a tough spot. I think he actually would check down his ace highs here a good bit of the time, given that the board didn't come off so scary. Um, or for ace high, at least. And I do think he would bet some gutters, but I just feel like he has two pair a bit too often there for me to call. I think it's close, because I think he, he's capable of floating that flop with like queen 10 type hand that isn't really no draw. But has some backdoor straight draws and overcard, or two overcards to mid pair. But I'm certainly okay with the fold. Here I limped, and he had auto check fold on, I believe. But I mean, it doesn't matter. I flop top pair. I'm gonna see bet, and he folds. Sorry, I was just pulling up another table. He's limped a couple times now, and I think I've raised the last two times he's limped, and he's folded. So, I'm not so sure that 
he's going to give me credit for another raise. Or uh, actually, more importantly, I think that he now is at the point where he might limp a strong hand because we've established a dynamic of him limping and me raising a good amount of the time. So I think I'm going to slow down on raising his limps. He is limping a lot more than he was early in the match, though, which is... I'm not really sure what it means as far as... I'm not sure if I can extrapolate from that uh, how he's kind of changed his overall game plan, but just something to note. He might be trying to slow down the match. I know that's something I'll do a lot. Oh, yeah. I had, When I just started this match, I had to pee really badly, and just waited it out, but uh, <clears throat> I guess I kept recording so you guys could see exactly how long it took me to pee. My bathroom's like just right in my office, basically, so it's a good location for me. I guess I could have skipped ahead, but I remember this being a very short break. Alright, I actually did skip ahead there because I guess time flies when you're peeing. I didn't realize how long that took. Um, back to the match. I consider raising my king nine there. It actually has a lot of value because he does is you know limping a lot, so I think he'll be limping weak hands there. But I guess I decided not to. I think it's fine either way. Now his uh, his raising range now, something to keep in mind, is stronger because he's starting to limp some of his weaker hands. I guess we should also note how often he's folding because he might be taking some of his folding hands and limping with them as well as some of his raising hands and limping with them. When he min raises, I actually think it's really weak, but I decided not to make a move with Queen Deuce off. Ace deuce deuce, pretty much the driest board you can imagine. So I'll make a small bet. I think there's not a whole lot of reason to bet larger on a board that dry. There's not even any kind of legitimate, not many backdoor draws he can even call with or anything. No overcards, so and gives you a good price on your c bet. And I think you should be doing it with your strong hands too, usually. So he's been raising my limps a lot, and I don't know, I'm kind of considering limp re-raising, uh, and I think that the first time I want to limp re-raise are with a strong hand, just because I think in general you don't get a ton of credit, or I think David wouldn't give me a ton of credit for my first limp re-raise. So I actually remember at this point in the match thinking that the next time I pick up a big hand, I, I'm going to limp it. I hope I remember to do that. This hand we just checked down. I was hoping to check down and be good, but I, there's no way I can call a river bet here. I think I also, yeah, I wanted to stop limping as many weak hands, just because of how often he's been raising. So I wanted to start limping with hands that I could re-raise or call with more often. I checked behind this flop, which I actually don't like. I think it's a board that he's going to peel with ace high all the time. If he did have a deuce, he'd, he'd call with it. And also, I just, no reason to give him six free outs. When he bets the turn like this, it's kind of a gross spot, but I call. I think that he would bet it with... A three or deuce if he had it, and then with some draws, but I think he has a, a weak 10 a lot of the time that he's looking to protect. But given the price, I think I can call there. And he did have a better three. I guess there aren't very many worse threes in his range there. He's not calling with 
7.3 suited, I believe. I think I had auto check fold there. That's a no no. Don't do that. And even though I flopped a pair, it's just too draw a board and being out of position, I just give up the pot. I think calling there's not terrible, but. You know, if any gutter's going to two-barrel you, you can't call two-barrel, and there are just too many hands that are going to two-barrel. 7-6, I think, is maybe just strong enough to call after limping. It's a terrible flop, because he's going to be—he's always going to be betting, I think, with his air, and he's going to have hit that flop a lot. Uh, he checks, though, which is interesting. I think that he has... When he checks, I think he has, like, tens or jack, maybe like 5-6 suited. And I actually believe I decided to... Oh, okay. I was thinking about betting because I have a, a whole lot of aces in my range, like weak aces when I limp call. But then I thought he wasn't checking to fold this flop, so it wasn't a very good spot. Uh, I think if I bet there, I'm going to have to fire multiple barrels. And it's not a great spot for firing multiple barrels because I can't rep a really big hand, you know? A lot of the hands I want to rep are hands like A7, where... A seven's not gonna, probably not gonna fire, you know, three big bets. And I think that's what's gonna take to get him off his hand a lot of the time there. So you see, I raise king three rather than limp with it because I don't, I can't really limp call with it. I'm starting to raise more of the hands that I can't limp call with, and limp more of the hands that I can call with, or re-raise. Still waiting on that big pocket pair to limp. Limping really slows down a match, as far as, you know, obviously just the pots are a lot smaller, so you're not playing as many big pots. I think that it's a really good thing to do, especially if you're winning a lot. Um, if you're, well, it's actually good if you're winning or losing. If you're losing against somebody, it's nice to slow down the, mat the match so that, uh, you don't kind of get carried away and make a lot of big mistakes. It just gives you some time to catch your breath. Uh, that hand, I think, was standard. I considered taking some weird lines, but I think they all look too strong. Check raising the flop and leading the turn. I didn't feel like I could get called by much, so I played the hand the way I did. I think it's standard. And he was unlucky to hit Jack there. Uh, the other reason to slow down a match and start limping a lot is if the other, if your opponent is down a lot. Uh, I think it's great because they just get so frustrated that, you know, they're stuck three buy-ins, and you're not letting them win a pot over ten big blinds, because you're just playing small pots the entire time. And I think it just puts them pretty badly on tilt and makes them play even worse. You know, there's something to be said for playing big pots while they're stuck just to uh, make them make big mistakes, or let them make big mistakes, since they're probably not on their A-game. But at the same time, that could get them unstuck, and I think the frustration that they get from you keeping all the pots very small uh, just increases your edge a lot. That's obviously not you know not the reason that either of us are limping in this match. There's not nobody has a really big lead. So I was going to limp call with eight four suited. I think it's just strong enough. I see better pretty dry high card flop. And get check raise. It's kind of weird because I expect him to raise king jack pre flop, but as I, I guess I just showed you, he's in another big hand, so I think he's a little less likely to be bluffing. I I was I wouldn't make a move there very often anyways, so uh, didn't really need to look at the other table. I think that he would have hands like king nine there a bit, and then most of the times he'd have value hands. It'd be king three or jack three, maybe pocket threes. All right, we flop top two pair after raising with kind of a weak hand. So we'll just make the standard C bet we've been making. He calls pretty quickly. Queen's an okay card. It's a good card for us because I think he's going to call a lot with any pair. I think that he has floats a lot and 
And that was just enough to check fold all his gutters and ace highs, but I think it's better to bet... I think I... Yeah, good. I think it's better to bet big here. I think that his gutters and ace high are folding anyways, and I think his pairs are calling, so might as well get more value out of his pairs. Whenever you make a bet, you have to think about, you know, what hands do I want this bet to be called by? What hands do I want to fold to it? Or You basically need to think, what am I trying to accomplish with this bet? And against what hands am I trying to accomplish that? And there are a lot of spots where people just make a big bet because they want somebody to fold when, you know, some a large part of the opponent's range is going to call a big bet uh, just because it's so strong and, you know, another part of his range is going to fold to any bet because it's so weak. So in those spots, a lot of times a smaller bet bluff is, uh, is a better play. Uh, and that's just one example. And then the other one is, you know, hands I'm looking to get value against. There's no reason to bet small there, I feel like, just because I'm going to, uh, I'm going to get called by hands, the same hands, pretty much, no matter what I bet there. All right, he's check-raised a couple times now. Uh, I wasn't looking to make a move on that board. I don't think he's super light there, but he certainly can be, and it's just something to watch out for. I, it seems like he's the kind of player that, I don't know, he's altering a strategy all the time, <clears throat> which is, you know, the right thing to do, but I think he might do it a little too obviously, like, he starts limping, and now he's going to be limping a lot, and then he starts check-raising flops, and now he's going to be check-raising flops a lot, which he wasn't doing before. And I think it's good, but I think it's bad to do against somebody who can readjust. So I guess he noticed that I've been c-betting a lot, so he decides to check-raise more flops, but I can notice pretty quickly how they're adjusting, and I think that's a pretty key skill in Heads Up, No Limit. So I check called the flop with bottom pair and a pretty good flush draw. He bets weak again. I actually think this means he has me beat a lot. But, you know, I have outs. Uh, I think my jack of diamonds is good most of the time. I know that my two pair outs are good, unless unless he has a hand like king jack. But, yeah, okay, I do call. Okay, and I do hit two pair. It's an interesting spot. I think that... The problem with the lead there is I'm pretty much never bluffing with that line, ever, ever. And I think he knows that. So I think it's better just to check call and hope he bluffs or value bets worse. And he actually was bluffing there, which surprised me. I thought that he'd be value betting a worse hand enough to call, but I didn't think he'd be bluffing very often. Just given uh, his turn bet size and the way that hand played out. The, the way that board looked. There I auto... I checked auto... or. Yeah, checked auto check fold and then unchecked it and raised. Uh, <laughs> I keep showing you that he's in big pots when I make moves on him. So yeah, I'm taking a note that uh, that's a play that he's capable of making that I didn't know before. I basically, you know, against a new player, I'll take a lot of notes, but once I've played so much with them, like I have with David, I just delete all my notes, but then take notes when I learned something new about them that I didn't think they were capable of or that they do very often. He min-raises, I think that is very weak, just given that he hasn't done it very often and I haven't been attacking, or I didn't attack it the one time he did it, I believe. So I'm going to raise for value. I mean, King Jack suited strong hand. But yeah, back to, I mean, back to dynamic heads-up play, I think that it's really the most important aspect of Heads Up No Limit is being able to adjust on the fly to your opponent. I actually, a while ago I was playing, uh, I, I was playing pretty often against Phil Ivey Heads Up, and I felt that in our first couple matches he, I don't want to go into too much detail, um, but he's making a lot of exploitable plays. And so I kind of thought about it for a while and developed a strategy where I would exploit all of the plays he was making and, uh, you know, I was all excited. All right, I'm going to take all his money now. And uh, within about 15, 20 minutes uh, after I'd started, you know, changing the way I played, 
he completely adjusted. He he noticed what I was doing right away and readjusted his game. And you know, I noticed it quickly and was able to readjust, but it kind of I mean, obviously I had a lot of respect for his game before that, but it gave me a lot more respect for his game because he is just so aware of what his opponents are doing and why they're doing it and and how to counter it, which is really what makes a great heads up player. Anyways, here he leads into me. Oh no, sorry. He uh he raised my limp and then C bet. I think uh, obviously I'm going to call the flop when I've middle pair and backdoor flush draw, backdoor straight draw. Turns pretty terrible one because it gives a lot of his overcard hands more outs and it improves some of his hands to beat me. It looks I'm considering a bet here because it looks very strong if I bet here. Just for my range, it looks very my hand looks very powerful if I bet the turn. And, well, I guess more than powerful, it looks not bluffy. So I don't expect him to make many moves here or to call me really light. But this bet is actually mostly a protection bet. And in hindsight, I don't like it. I think that he's not ever going to fold a better hand. But, uh, you know, it was more of a protection bet than a bluff. But I think that if he has a hand like ace-king, ace-jack, basically there's so many draws on this board that I feel like he's two-barreling a lot. And so I feel like when he checks the turn, a lot of his range is a good eight or a ten or jacks or nines, something like that. Just because there isn't much air on this board. All the air has at least four outs, or seven outs, let's say, with an overcard, and is going to be firing again. So I don't expect to get too many folds with a bet like this. I think that... If I'm gonna make a play like that, it needs to be. I think I'm gonna need to two barrel pretty large to take him off a queen or a ten or jacks or something. Now he checks the river, and again, this is an interesting spot. You know, he has. He likely has like a ten, maybe an eight. I think he has an eight a lot of the time, uh, or nines or jacks, but jacks hit. Uh, nines hit also. Hmm. Well, I think a big part of his range is a ten or a queen, or an eight, and then some of them hit, you know, with with a nine or a jack. I don't think he has ace king very often and plays it that way. I also don't think he has spades very often. I don't think I can rep spades that much, but well, no, that's not true. I would play spades like that, but you know, people usually don't give you credit for a backdoor flush draw but I pretty much can't have air. The only hand that's air here is 5-7, and then like ace-high floats that decided to play it the way I did. So it's not a bad spot to bluff, but I just feel that, you know, his range... I guess I'm basically too worried that he improved with that jack, which he did, and actually that, that hand right there, him showing me king-jack, kind of makes some of my assumptions wrong, because... I felt that he would be two barreling with his hands like that uh, rather than check calling. And I'm not sure if he was planning on check raising, but then saw that I made a small bet and decided he should just check call. Uh, I should have bet that turn. I was <laughs> mad about the last hand. Uh, obviously against King Jack, I should have I should have bet that river. But I was just too worried that he had a uh, river two pair, river to straight, or maybe even a flush that I, I didn't, uh, that scared me out of taking a stab at it. But I, I was surprised that he showed me King Jack there. It's just a very, very strange way to play it. Just because if I make a large bet on the turn, he doesn't really have odds to call. Except that, you know, he might have implied odds if he hits an ace that I'm going to bet call off with worse or bluff off big because I think he can't have that hand because I pretty much fully eliminated that from his range. Anyways, I think it's better on his part just to bet. I'm not sure if he's planning on, as I said, planning on check raising, which is an okay play, but stacks are a little bit awkward for it. But I think I played that hand, f well, I actually don't at all like my uh, turn bet sizing. I think I should... Bet bigger or bet smaller, or bet bigger or not bet at all, for the reasons I 
I've already said. Anyways, I limp here like I have been planning to do for so long, and my plan is foiled. You just auto-check folds, and then sh check folds to flop. And so I still kind of want to limp re-raise strong, if I get another strong hand. A5 suited, sometimes I call, sometimes I re-raise. I think it depends on your opponent and, you know, flow of match, but given this flow of match, I think that it's a good re-raise here. I haven't been re-raising much. He seems to be folding when I do, which is actually something that he's changed a bit, too. He used to not fold to many 3-bets at all. One thing to think about is that he is limping a bit, so his raising range is a little stronger. But still, at the same time, I think it's better. I think it's a, a good play there to 3-bet. I 3-bet again. Um, I think some people shy away from 3-betting light twice in a row, or 3-betting light just after they've 3-bet, even if they were strong the last time. But I don't think it's necessarily great to do. It depends on your opponent and what level he's on, but you certainly have to sometimes. And I think that was a good hand to do it with. I was going to limp call with a6. I flop top pair. Pretty standard bet. He has been check raising limp pots a little bit, so had he check raised there, I obviously would have called, but I would have been a little worried if he fired a few more barrels, uh, even though there are not many credible hands he can rep. He limps here, and 6 8 suited's a very strong hand, so I, I think it's a good deceptive hand to raise a limp with. If he does call, I think that, you know, he's going to fold, he's going to give me credit for high cards so often that I can take it down when the flop comes high, and I can flop a good hand if flop comes low. Here's a good flop to see bet. I do have ace high, which is showdownable, but uh, it's pretty dry board that he's not going to make too many moves on. I do have backdoor flush draw, so if he calls, I have... You know, two overs to a lot of his calling hands and some outs. He's also involved in a big pot here, as I showed you again. Uh, I think that really is important, though, and I'm glad I showed you so that uh, you can kind of get an idea of how I'm playing, or uh, or what I was thinking, exactly what I was thinking at the time, rather than just kind of my guess to what I was thinking at that time, because, you know, as much as I remember the match, it's still hard to remember exactly what I was thinking at the time. Anyways, this jack is a decent card to two barrel on. I decide to for a couple reasons. One being that he's involved in another big hand, so I think he's not going to make a move. Or if he does have a hand like a six, I think he's just going to be like, well, whatever. I'll fold. It's close. I'll fold and worry about this other hand that I'm in. Uh, I also think that he floats with ace high, which, you know, is the same hand I have, but uh, it's fine. It's, you know, good to take him off a hand like that. And the other thing is that he, he's been leading or check-raising a lot of his top pair type hands. I felt that he would check-raise mm, he would check raise a good top pair, like queen-jack plus, and he would lead with a lot of weaker top pairs. So I think he has a six or some kind of gutter or ace-high a lot. And even though I'm ahead of his gutters, uh, I'll have to fold to a river bet probably. And, you know, he has flush draw some that... I don't. I actually don't know what he would do with a flush draw here. He might check fold the turn, but most people don't like to fold draws. Anyways, I think that he has a mid-pair a lot, and jacks another overcard to that. I also, if he does have a mid-pair, I have six outs, and there are a lot of rivers that I can bluff. I might even... Uh, I think I would bluff some blank rivers, too. And he folds. 8-9 suited. Yeah. Uh, I think that, given that I've been 3-betting him a lot in the recent past, and given that it's such a strong hand that I, I don't want to get 4-bet off of it, you know, uh, and like 5-7 suited, I, I'd like to 3-bet, or 8-5 suited, I guess, was the one I 3-bet before. I kind of prefer 3-betting that and calling with 8-9 suited, just because their value in a 3-bet pot isn't all that different, but their value in a single-race pot is, so I'd rather... Uh, save the value of my 8-9 suited by playing it this way, and you know, most of your value when you 3-bet comes from your bluffing equity. Uh, I bet the turn here, which I think is standard. I have two overcards to any kind of non-top pair, which I think is what he has, and I also have a gutter. 
I decided to check because the board comes off pretty poorly, and I think that people call pretty often when when the board rolls off like that after checking behind the flop. And I think he has a made hand when he checks behind that flop almost always. Decided to raise it up with Jack Eight suited. He hasn't really shown me any desire to fight for his limps. He's just been limp folding every time, so it's time to start attacking him. I think actually I could have been doing it with weaker hands and maybe even just checking Jack Eight suited type hands that flop fairly well. But you know, it is nice to have some strongish hands that flop well for just in case he calls. Ace ten, I flop top pair. And obviously just make standard C bet. He seems to be kind of autopiloting, check folding a lot now, so that's just something to note. I think I can start to take a lot more pots away from him, small pots that is, and then in big pots I should be a little bit wary that he's, you know, more likely to have a strong hand. I don't know if it's because he's involved in, you know, another heads up match now. I think he might have had a third table too, or if just, I don't know. People just get in, you know, moods, and maybe he's just in a nitty mood. I'm typing in chat, so I remember that, it, you know, he hasn't 3-bet me in a long time, which is, you know, going with his... Um, the way he started to play nitty. So I am going to give his 3-bets a lot of respect now. That's why I said something like that. And, yeah, so I'm going to limp re-raise here, and I think it's okay. I know that I said I was waiting for a strong hand to do it with, but uh, his mood right now is that he's just not going to... I don't think he's going to be making a lot of, like, crazy plays, just given his mood. Uh, and so I felt like this was a good spot. I flop a gutter, but it doesn't matter all that much, because a lot of times I'm getting... He's going to check fold or check raise, but I think I have to C-bet. You know, I 3-bet and... Or, sorry, I limp re-raise, so I think I I'm, I have ace-king, aces, or kings a whole bunch of the time. And, you know, even though I do have queens or jacks some, I would check those behind, so I think that he doesn't think that I'm going to be betting for... betting my strong limp re-raise hands here and folding to a shove. And I don't, you know... Obviously, I have some air like this, but I think that he has to give me a lot of credit. He shoved, so it didn't work. I'm pretty curious as to what he had, what he played like that. I, th I have a suspicion that it was a very strong hand. But it could have just been, you know, king-jack, king-queen type hand. I don't think... I wonder what he would have done with, like, a 10-jack suited with a backdoor flush draw there. With a gutter and a backdoor flush draw. I think that he's certainly capable of shoving, but maybe not in the mood to make a shove like that. He probably would have. You know, the thing that most people don't realize is they'll shove a hand like King-10 there all day, every time, and then fold a hand like 10-jack suited when, in actuality, the value of shoving those two hands is pretty similar. You know, if I'm bet calling, I have King-10 beat, and it has usually fewer outs than Jack-10 suited. Uh, the only benefit of having King-10 there is it makes my Ace-King, King-King hand combinations, you know, it removes some hand combinations of that. So it's really more valuable just as a blocker than it is uh, as a hand for value. I think that most people don't realize that when, you know, people are representing very strong hands, they only get I hope I don't, yeah, I don't 4-bet, because I was just talking about how he's not 3-betting light. Sorry, what I was saying is that in a lot of spots where your opponent's repping a very strong hand, people overvalue their weak made hands and undervalue their draws, because if he's folding, it doesn't matter what you had, and if he's not folding, a draw is actually better than your weak made hand, because it has more outs against his very strong hand. So when somebody has a polarized range... I think that it's good to uh, value your draws a little higher than your made hands there. Alright, so King-Jack, I consider check-raising the flop small, but that would have been FPSC, I think. 
So now I'm cons um, thinking about leading the turn, and I do. I think it's okay. I think that, you know, whenever you want to value bet, you have to be able to rep some bluffs, and I think that I can play a hand like diamonds like this because I don't want to check and then have to check fold or check call or check raise. Uh, I can also play a hand like 5-4 like this, maybe queen-10. Probably not a king-10 because I feel like with king-10 I would be checking, hoping to check it down and sh show down the best hand, maybe check call the turn. He raises. It's a weird spot. You know, his range is obviously very polarized. I think that I look like ace-x, ace-10 maybe, uh, with the occasional bluff, and maybe maybe he does put me on a hand like king-jack here. I'm not sure what the best play is here. Obviously, I'm not going to re-raise. I decided to call, which I'm not super okay with. I just don't think he's going to bluff me there, because I think I have an ace far too often, which is also why I don't really like my bet. I think I should have checked, just because I think that my hand looks too strong when I lead to get much value. But uh, the reason I call is that I'm getting great odds on the turn. Something like 4 to 1, maybe. And I don't think he can bluff the river after I call the turn. Just because of how often... I pretty much always have an ace, in his mind. Granted, my hand is just as strong as ace 10 here. But, uh, with you know, with the exception of the card removal thing. But I just think that he's never going to bluff this river after I call the turn there, because I just look way too strong. Obviously, David's capable of realizing that I think that, and maybe trying to push me off of a hand, but I just don't think he's going to try to push me off of, you know, trips. He's not going to try to push me off an ace when the board has two aces on it. It's just not something people like to fold. Um, I'm not sure why I'm thinking about this. I think it's a pretty easy fold. Um... I do distinctly remember calling the turn with the plan to fold the river because my justification for calling the turn was that he's just not going to bluff river, so I'm getting 4-1, to one and that'll be the only bet I have to call if he's bluffing. And I, I'm, you know, I can sleep easy after folding that hand. I really don't think I have the best hand almost ever. But that is another mistake I think I made. I don't really like my turn lead. Uh, if I if we had a history of me leading turns lighter, check call lead, uh, that would be good, but we just don't at all. It's not something that I do too often, and it's not something I've been doing against David this match. My threes here are just no good. Um, I mean, I could have. The, I don't mean no good in that I can't have the best hand, but I certainly don't have the best hand enough to bet, and certainly not enough to call a bet if he bets. So that's just pretty easy check fold. I guess I'm looking back at that King Jack hand. But yeah, I think it's totally standard. Here's, you know, another really dry flop that you don't have to bet very much at. I think it's pretty standard just to half pot it. It's a bit of a protection bet because I don't expect him to fold ace high or king high, maybe. But it also, you know, it protects me against hands like 10-9 sucking out, and it protects against it protects against uh, him bluffing turns, because I can't really call a turn bet. Interesting spot here. The cool thing about an ace, uh, even though he does check call with a lot of aces, is that if he check called with uh, like a pair, or if he check called with uh, king high, he can't really call the turn. Just I mean, he could, but he has no outs if he's behind, when, when, if I bet the turn. This is pretty weird. That I, uh, you know, now I river a boat and he's betting. I don't know if he's capable of betting a hand like nines here, but I just don't think he's bluffing ever, 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 because he's check calling the flop with a full house, uh, quads or ace high or king high, and I think king high will just show down when the board comes ace queen. He's not going to turn that into a bluff because I don't know what hands he thinks he's going to fold out, and uh, ace high is obviously. Ace is full. Or six is full of aces. I limp King Jack to limp call. I wonder if I was planning on limp re-raising. I don't think it's strong enough to. I don't think that's what I was doing. Make a C bet and I turn a king, which is a great card. First of all, because I think he thinks I'll barrel this card a lot, and second of all, 
because it gives me top pair good kicker. So I bet again. He calls pretty quickly. Six of spades on the river is not a great card. He definitely has some sixes. But again, I think this is a card that he thinks I'll barrel a lot. So, um, given that he thinks I'm going to be bluffing this river a lot, and I, you know, he has weaker hands a whole bunch, I think I certainly have to value bet. And I'm considering an over bet here. And I decided to go ahead and make it. I think that... Alright, he insta folded, but I want to talk about it for a minute. I think that it's okay, but I think I would have preferred a smaller bet. The problem with an overbet is, you know, first of all, he does have sixes or flushes some, but we also just haven't had a history of me overbetting, and I think that he might, I think he would interpret that as more strength than weakness. Even though Benjamin does like to pick off bluffs, and overbets look bluffy to some people, I just think that looks a little bit too strong. And, you know, I think that when I get called, I'm more often than not ahead, but I think that I'm I'm beat a decent amount of the time when called. He is the type, as we've seen, to check call draws twice there. So if he has, like, a like a queen five of spades, I think that he's capable of just check calling twice. Uh, one benefit to the overbet is that he's not going to be check raising a six, like six seven or a weak flush, so it saves me some money some of those times um, because I, I would be tempted to call a check raise. So it does save me some money against those hands, I guess. But I can always just bet full. It's not the end of the world, you know. I don't know how often you would be bluffing in a spot like that. So I think I would have preferred a more normal size bet there. So I go ahead and 3-bet 5-3 diamonds. I like to 3-bet this hand just because I think it's a little bit too weak to call, but just, just barely too weak to call, which makes it a good hand to bluff 3-bet with. So far in the match, neither of us has gotten two out of line, uh, with the exception of my bluff 4-bet. And, you know, he's made some bluffs in smaller pots, but the match has been pretty straightforward. So I think that it's a good time to start getting out of line a little bit. Just because I think that he, we've kind of both settled into a comfort level. I think people get a little bit too comfortable sometimes when they're, um, when matches are just going straightforwardly, I guess, if that's a word. So I make a small c-bet here, just as I've been doing on dry boards the whole match, but unfortunately he folds. Which, you know, he's going to do most of the time on that board. Which is why it's a good board to c-bet. Pick up jacks, which is nice. Um, I could limp raise but especially... Especially, I think, given our history, I don't think he's going to think I'm that light there. Weird spot here, just because... Alright, here's the thing. In the past, David Benjamin is not a good person to 4-bet stack off with jacks with, just because he's never folding, obviously, ace-queen, ace-king. Um, and he's never folding 10s, but other than that, he didn't use the 3-bet very light, so uh, I never got him to... He wasn't ever 3-betting like a ace-4 suited that he would then shove as a as a 5-bet sometimes. So I'm not really getting him to bluff 5-bet shove ever. This is past David, not present David, which I'm who I'm you know not so sure about his 3-bet 4-betting tendencies and 5-betting tendencies. Um, I think that he ha uh So I think that when we get the money in pre-flop, he has 10s plus and ace-queen and ace-king. So I'm actually behind that range very slightly, I believe. Um, there's some merit to protecting my hand uh, against, you know, ace-10 or ace-jack, things like that, that I'm ahead of, but don't want to give a free flop to. 
And since he's been 3-betting a lot more this match, even though not so much in the past, in the very recent past, I think it's just a good hand to 4-bet. He also used to peel. So he used to call here with hands like Queen-Jack, which he did just call there. And we get a pretty weird slash ugly spot here. Um, there's a little bit over pot size bet left. We have the flush draw and under pair. I don't think he has ace king or ace queen because he would have uh, shoved preflop. So this is a little bit better a situation for me. If he doesn't have ace king or ace queen, and he very likely doesn't have ace jack because I have two of the jacks and there's an ace on board. And he very likely doesn't have queens or kings because he would have shoved those. I think that I can actually bet call here because he doesn't 3-bet ace-9. So I'm really beat by ace-10. Okay. I checked and I... Uh, I'll pause right here. I don't like my check. Uh, it's another one of the moves that I made a mistake on, which is good to uh, good to realize. I think that um, if I'm right about his preflop tendencies, he's not going to have ace-king, ace-queen almost ever. He's not going to have ace-jack very often. He has ace-10 some, but against that, um, my flush draws live and my jacks are two more outs. And I think that he could shove a hand like I don't know. Uh, obviously, tens with the ten of diamonds, nines with the nine of diamonds. Um, if he made a move with like six seven, maybe six seven with the seven of diamonds. Although I doubt he has six seven offsuit actually. Maybe like seven eight of hearts. He might check shove. Um, so I don't hate my check because I I don't know what I'm getting much value from. From I also think he could shove hands like king queen with a diamond, but you know. I'm not doing great against those hands. Certainly fine to get it in against them, though. Given that I checked the flop, I think I have to check the turn. And this board's come off pretty... This is a weird spot, just because I, I'm i fairly clueless about his range to call 4-bet with there. I did make a small 4-bet, but I'm not really sure what he would play like this. And now, I'm not really sure what he thinks I'm folding. Um, just because I, I obviously don't have a very strong hand. Not obviously, but very likely don't have a very strong hand. I very likely have uh, tens, jacks, queens, or kings. I decided to fold just because I really didn't think that he would expect me to check the flop and turn to fold to a smallish river bet. And I didn't have a lot of time bank there because I'd used it up on other hands, but I would have liked to have had some more time to think about that. I think it's a pretty tough spot. Uh, just because of his, you know, so few hand combinations that have an ace in them. I think that if I was beat there, it's more often to hand like pocket nines, um, or maybe like seven eight suited, that hit on the river. Or maybe, maybe a set but that flopped, but I doubt it. I think he would have bet the turn if he had flopped a set. So I guess I'm going to actually wrap up this video. Uh, I guess we'll play out this sweet top pair hand. He bets half pot like he's been doing every time. And you know, I can check call or I can check raise. I think either's okay. Uh, I think I prefer a raise slightly just because I'd like to have some top pair hands in my range when I raise. And this is top pair. I think he'll, he'll bet call with... Any, any pair on that flop and some ace high type hands. Uh, I think now this is a very easy value bet. He calls with any pair. He calls with any pair for sure and some ace highs just because of all the straight draws that missed. How often I'll be bluffing when the diamond hits uh, if I have those straight draws. Things like that. And he folds. So we will wrap up the video. But uh, a couple interesting hands. Definitely the re-raise or four bet pot there with Jax is the most interesting. I'm still actually not sure what the best play is, other than I think that I should have bet called the flop, just because of how often I think he f shoves pre-flop with an ace in his range. And I really do feel like if if I had to pick one hand, even though there are so few combinations of it, I think he had a hand like I think he had pocket nines that uh, being set on the river. And, you know, the other possibility is that he flopped a flush with, like, a king-queen suited or something like that and was going for a check raise on the flop and turn value bet on the river. But I, I think I played that hand pretty well, uh, other than I do feel like I should have bet called the flop. 
Uh, and, and yeah, overall, I made a few mistakes, as I expected to make. But uh, I guess we will pick it up next video, and I think finish off the session. Uh, it's been Phil Galfon for BlueFirePoker.com. See you next time.